Hi, my name's Phil. I like to talk about politics. In this video, I'd like to discuss another aspect of Michael Gove's response to the Parliamentary Select Committee on Brexit, that of refusing to extend the transition period, even though the London talks that were supposed to be our ace card for a great deal are potentially going to be called off. But first, if you'd like to be notified of daily news and politics, then please subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification icon. So, Boris Johnson's government responses and behaviour where the EU talks are concerned are a bit of a mess when you try to follow every strand of them. On the one hand, the government keeps saying that they won't align at all with the EU and that they won't impose checks on the border between Great Britain and Ireland, despite signing an international treaty saying, of course, we're absolutely going to do that. But on the other hand, when asked about this very thing at the Parliamentary Select Committee earlier this week, Michael Gove wouldn't answer. He deferred in sale instead to the uh, Joint Committee on the, on the matter between the UK and the EU. And, and that seems strange because when you follow one strand of government behaviour, it's all very aggressive and obstructionist, uh, making any sort of deal, even a bare bones deal, seem quite impossible. In fact, it actually makes the no deal Brexit seem like the goal, which is what we assume is his goal. But on the other hand, you then have a very senior pro-Brexit minister refusing to give the same bellicose belligerent response when asked by MPs in a select committee suggesting that although publicly they're going to say of course we're not going to impose checks where there is no real comeback you know lying in public no real comeback it suggests that when asked in parliament very closely that there are still some ministers who do not want to be seen to be lying to MPs in a select committee or elsewhere in parliament and therefore that in reality they understand they are going to have to impose those checks and it's this inconsistency in what they say and what they do that has created such a divided Britain on the issue of Brexit, really. So, for example, you've got a good chunk of the country saying Boris Johnson promised that we'd have billions extra to spend on the NHS by leaving the EU because we'll have all that money left. They can't understand why everyone else is opposed to it. The NHS is brilliant. Everyone agrees that. Why wouldn't you want more money for it? But then you've got everyone else knowing full well that the NHS isn't getting a penny more by leaving the EU. Confirmed, if you didn't know beforehand, in the budget two days ago where, yeah, all this 350 million quid a week that Boris Johnson promised for it. No, not there. Not there at all. Just a vague promise that the NHS will get everything it needs to deal with this latest little bug. Uh, but not materialised into any actual new resources for them. So when you look at one strand of government behaviour in isolation, of course you could follow it and you follow it to a logical conclusion. It all makes sense. But when you look at them all at once, they're all over the place. Not all outcomes are possible, so you know that some strands have to be effectively red herrings. But which ones? So Michael Gove refused to say whether or not there would be checks at the border in the Irish Sea. However, he did say categorically that there would be no extension to the transition period. Despite calls earlier in the week to think about it, uh, based on the disruption likely to be caused by this certain global health-related crisis that shall go unnamed, and Gove did allude to the disruption. You know, we have a series of talks scheduled to take place in the UK with EU officials at the end of this month. These were supposed to be our ace card. Brexiteers were dismissing our embarrassing performance during the withdrawal negotiations as being well, that's because the talks always took place in Brussels. Now we've won this major victory. We're going to have some talks taking place in London. We're going to see the power unleashed. Yes, I know, but they're running out of straws to clutch onto at the moment. But the point is that Gove was saying that these meetings may not now go ahead as travel may not be possible. We don't know that the meetings won't go ahead, just to be clear. It's just that with the current situation at the moment, Brussels had to inform the UK that there may be difficulties. Because uh, so, I mean, this is in several weeks' time. The situation may have got much worse in several weeks' time. We'll have to see. So a major round of talks will be potentially cancelled. And yet, there was a still a definitive no to the idea of extended talks. International meetings of all sorts are being cancelled at the moment. Sporting events, major conventions. It's inevitable that this will also affect major political gatherings as well. And it would be surprising if no Brexit talks were affected at all. 
And yet there isn't even the possibility of extending from what was already an unrealistically tight timetable. Not even the we don't have plans to extend that came from Downing Street earlier this week. No, we're definitely not extending according to Michael Gove in that select committee. And again, given that he was so evasive on the issue of checks on the IRC, but so definitive about this, that does indicate that that genuinely is their position. So in this one exchange with a senior Brexit minister, you have one strand that makes it look like it was in the align in alignment with the EU. And, and, and of course, we're going to um, fulfill our international obligations uh, in the interest of cooperation and in the interest of not making ourselves look like uh, promise breakers, oath breakers to the whole world. But then you have another strand taking us to the no deal Brexit that was always going to be economically disastrous. Um, but on top of a global economic crisis that's unfolding at the moment, that's surely going to compound things for UK in ways that I cannot imagine yet. Finally, I just I, the, there was one thing that I think some of you may well be thinking, certainly I've been thinking it a few times, and that is, why is such a big deal being made of the fact that officials will not be able to travel to these meetings potentially? Can't they just do the same thing via teleconferencing? They don't have to be physically in the same space. They just need to talk to each other in real time. It's the 21st century, for goodness sake. Yes, I agree. They easily could do that, but they never do. It never ceases to amaze me just how archaic businesses and politics alike are. But that is how they are. If these face-to-face -face meetings at the end of March are called off, they will not take place. They're not just going to get on Skype. That means that there will be even less progress made for the June stock-taking phase, which may also have to take place remotely, making it much more likely that Boris Johnson will have to follow through on his threats to end talks then and there, because that's what he said he's going to do if there's not enough progress made. Either that or he has to risk looking much weaker. So I hope you found the video interesting. If you did, don't forget to click the like button. And if you'd like to support the channel further, then please also click the Patreon link for details. And until next time, I'll see you later.